Welcome uh, to this uh, first session in the afternoon on Japan uh, in the global system. Uh, when you look uh, at uh, the global system, uh, as my old friend, uh, the late Foreign Minister of Japan, several people would have said, uh, uh, the global system is somewhat messy. Uh, and. Uh, what this uh, panel is going to do is talk about how <coughs> Japan's managing uh, the messiness in the global system and what uh, Japan's positioning might look like going forward. Uh, Japan, in many ways, is in the crucible of the huge changes that have taken place in the geopolitical system uh, in Northeast Asia uh, between. China and the United States, uh, and uh, with a critical relationship uh, in the alliance relationship with the United States uh, and the new Trump administration. The advent of Trump presents very big challenges for Japan uh, and to the post war system uh, in which Japan has prospered greatly. Not only the security relationship, and I want to talk about this with. Uh, panelists later on, but also the international economic policy regime, which uh, is uh, under threat by from the emergence of protectionism, which Trump symbolizes more than represents uh, in the United States, but also uh, in Europe. Uh, so this is a big challenge to not only economic security, but also the political security. Uh, now, you know, we have the North Korean crisis, uh, and that brings uh, into acute focus uh, all of these problems. And again, Japan's right in the center uh, of the action. Uh, uh, and uh, Japan's participation in the management uh, of this crisis, uh, or these crises, uh, one would have thought was cr crucial uh, for some kind of resolution of the chaos that's appeared in the international political and economic system. Uh, how is Japan coping with it? That's a question. And what can Japan do about it? what leverage it's got in its relationships in Northeast Asia, but also across the Pacific with the United States. Uh, there's a fairly long-held view, and I must say I contributed to this to some extent by inventing the super K, Japan's leading from behind, that Japan's <laughs> not good at a proactive strategic response in circumstances like we face in the international political and economic system now. Uh, but how well has Japan done, in fact, in this? And uh, how well is Japan positioning itself to manage uh, these, at least, uh, trifold crises? Uh, that's the set of questions that I want to turn to our panelists to talk about and then to talk with you in the audience about it. Uh, more specifically, you know, how is uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, positioned uh, in all this, and, and how can he project uh, Japan's interests successfully and define some kind of decisive role for Japan in managing uh, these circumstances in the global and regional system? The panel, uh, you've met already uh, Professor Fumiaki Kubo from Tokyo University, of law there, a specialist on international relations, especially the North American relationship. Uh, and introduced Nobuhiro Aizawa, who's a professor uh, at uh, Kyushu University in Japan, a uh, specialist in international relations. And uh, our own Amy King from uh, the uh, Department of Strategic and Defence Studies in the Coral Bell School uh, in the College of Asia Pacific. Uh, three better panellists you couldn't imagine to take up some of these issues. So let me turn to you first, Fumiaki, and 
And yet when you look at the circumstances that uh, Mr. Abe has had to face over the last uh, few months, really since, uh, not a year now, I guess it is almost since Trump uh, was elected to the presidency of the United States, what's at stake uh, in the management of the Trump administration from the perspective of Mr. Abe in Japan? What's at stake for Japan in this? Okay, uh, great, great question. Uh, thank you uh, for having me again. Uh, some of you may not like me to, <laughs> like to see me again, you know. <laughs> twice, but uh, you know, uh, I got a very uh, good question. Uh, I will cite North Korea and China, now, and uh, the threat from North Korea is, uh, in a sense, uh, very much uh, existentialist, existential threat to Japan. And, uh, also, uh, we have a, a territorial dispute over uh, Senkaku or Dayu Islands uh, with China. And uh, last year, during the campaign uh, in the United States, uh, Mr. Trump said that uh, you know he might withdraw uh, U.S. troops from Korean Peninsula or from Japan, or you know, Japan should, uh, according to him, uh, defend yourself. Or he, he said that uh, it would be okay for Japan to go nuclear. You know? And also, when he was asked uh, about what he would do uh, regarding uh, the disputed uh, the island Senkaku, you know, if he becomes uh, president, he uh, evaded the question. He said, simply said that I, like, I, like, I don't like to uh, answer that question. So on November 7th in Japan, there's a really uh, great anxiety you know, uh, about the incoming the president. So you know, Abe flew to New York to see Mr. Trump. And uh, then we had a, a summit meeting, a formal one, uh, after Trump uh, assumed office in February. And our hope was that at least you know, we need to get uh, public uh, assurance uh, from the US president, new US president, that the Article 5 uh, of the US-Japan Security Treaty, which uh, stipulates the American obligation to defend Japan, would be honored by this new administration too. And otherwise, without uh, that assurance uh, that the uh, uh, challenges or uh, escalation uh, might be expected uh, by China uh, over Senkaku Islands. And then we also uh, need a public commitment that uh, the, the new administration, U.S. administration, would, would honor the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. And I think, you know, basically in February we got all of this. So there's, for the time being, uh, some assurances. Uh, the sense, we have a sense that uh, the worst was evaded. But uh, given uh, a kind of erratic nature of Mr. Trump, uh, unpredictable, you know, uh, the words and the swings between negotiation to like uh, the military, you know, the option, you know, uh, there's still some anxiety about what are uh, the real intention of this government. And, uh, you know, we have some assurances that, uh, that Trump seem to be trusting uh, his uh, defense secretary, Mattis, uh, which is good. But uh, in the final analysis, we don't know uh, whether you know, Mattis' decision would be kind of honored by Mr. That, that, uh, Mr. Trump you know, further. So you know, uh, we have an uh, enormous stake you know, here. And we have some assurances, some you know, uh, uh, peace of mind. But uh, we're still uh, wondering what, you know, uh, there's some uh, element of unpredictability um, uh, with this uh, US uh, you know, new government. But, uh, you know, somehow, I don't know why, but the personal chemistry between Prime Minister Abe and Mr. Trump seems to be pretty good. I don't know why. Uh, your Prime Minister did have a summer, you know, fight <laughs> with Mr. Trump. Uh, we don't afford to fight, but also, you know, some, you know, and uh, there's really a telephone call pretty very often from the White House. Uh, in the last, like, uh, just limited to the last two weeks, I think there are three uh, telephone conversations between the Prime Minister and the President. Uh, I heard that there was a 
call from Mr. Trump before the G7 summit, and the question was, what the G summit all about? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that is interesting. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Let me, let me press you on that. It's, it's really quite interesting, uh, especially to scholars of, of Japan, but to everybody, because you know, what Mr. Abe did was really get on the front foot there. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, maybe Aizawa might have something to say about this too, but you know, uh, was, was this Trump, uh, was this uh, uh, all Abe's initiative with Trump? Or, I mean, the whole system must have swung into play here to position Japan with Trump in a very effective way. Looking mm -hmm. from outside Japan, you must say that uh, Japan scored high uh, in its response to the character of the new Trump administration and securing the assurance that, mm -hmm. that you just explained that it, it has secured thus far from, mm -hmm. from President Trump. What do, you, what, what do you think about how the system, how Japanese government worked in, in that respect, quite apart from Trump? Oh, uh, Trump, quite apart from well, Trump. Yeah. Uh, just uh, briefly, you know, I think, you know, Mr. Abe's uh, personal leadership and initiative uh, worked uh, pretty effectively in this case, that there was an enormous sense of crisis on November 7th in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, you know, worked, uh, that was pretty important. But you know, uh, please note that uh, you know, Japan lost on some fronts, like TPP, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the Abe tried hard mm -hmm. to persuade Trump that mm -hmm. the TPP is a good thing, but uh, he failed. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese public uh, is very critical of Mr. Trump. You know, mm -hmm. uh, based on the public opinion, that the Japanese uh, tend to think that the Trump is untrustworthy, arrogant, you know, not suited for the president, but still asked about the future or the, the, or, or the, the direction of the U.S.-Japan relations, the public said that uh, it should be maintained. So, you know, we tend to differentiate our evaluation of Mr. Trump and the U.S.-Japan alliance. Nova, what do you think about the, how the Japanese government mechanism and machinery has managed the, the response to Trump? I think I, I fully um, follow what uh, Kubo Sensei's line. Um, it, it's, in my words, it will be like a damage control. Um, so there's two damage control, uh, two damages, possible damages has to be controlled. One is absolutely the, the public um, opinion. Uh, you, you can't afford the public opinion to turn against the United States because uh, the U.S. alliance is, uh, is a pretty strong uh, political pillar for Japanese strategy making. So you can't have the public to go against. That's number one. Number two will be um, actually uh, like the deep. I mean, I don't think Prime Minister Abe has a very positive, you know, perspective. But he has done what he needs to do. Especially, um, you know, you you know, you know, one of the pillars, this liberal liberal uh, democratic order. You know, all these principles that Japan strategically relies on. Could be, you know, at risk with this, you know, uh, new configuration of U.S.-Japan allies. So he he needed to, you know, show uh, stand up to make sure the damage could be controlled in, in the best way possible. And I think that was the leadership. So so I think that's what we do understand. Um, whether we like uh, President Trump or not, um, I think that was the one favorable move that that President uh, Prime Minister Abe has done. So. Uh the Japanese government's got these key assurances on the alliance relationship, the defense of the territories, and reassurance about uh, It's Japan. not an assurance, but we don't, <laughs> we won't consider assurance. We're not, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but try, you know, there is a commitment to do, do that. So this is the source of uh, your doubt, the, the fragility of these assurances, or other other mm -hmm. things at play that you see as still open questions with respect to dealing with the Trump administration? Well, uh, if you listen to what Mr. Trump uh, says, you know, he is very tough with North Korea at one day, yeah. but uh, the other day he might suggest uh, like uh, the negotiation. But also at the same time, he's strong uh, with uh, the defense of uh, the Republic of Korea, but uh, he's also threatening to uh, revoke uh, the U.S. Korea FTA, you know, chorus, you know, uh, and is it a balanced uh, foreign policy, you know, to suggest that the uh, U.S. would terminate the basic economic arrangement between Korea and the United States? And if you see that, uh, you have to think that uh, that might be coming, might be coming to Japan too. And so, you know, overall, you know, we cannot be assured that uh, 
entire overall you know, uh, the Trump administration's foreign policy is balanced, uh, well considered, you know, uh, enough attention paid to the details. You know, uh, I'm a bit uh, dubious about that. We'll come back to what Japan's interests are in the management of the North Korean crisis mm -hmm. in a moment and how they might diverge or mm -hmm. otherwise from those of the United States in the management of the North Korean crisis. But uh, in, uh, in respect of uh, you know, tr Trump's, uh, Trump's dealing, well, he dealt everyone this bad, everyone this bad hand, and, and the Japanese public uh, likewise are very skeptical of the Trump administration. Uh, does, this, does this mean that you know, Abe's political reverses uh, are likely to be reversed in themselves, in that uh, you know, uh, Abe can take significant public credit uh, having dealt with a very difficult situation in Washington, or or doesn't impact on on public perceptions of, mm -hmm. of Abe and the Abe government. Okay. Either, either one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, his uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, support rate approval ratings are coming back, you know, uh, last month and uh, probably this month. Uh, the reason was uh, first uh, there's a cabinet reshuffling and. Uh, people uh, tend to see new faces in the cabinet. But uh, the second uh, big reason uh, would be probably uh, is uh, economy, you know, uh, we have a, a labor shortage as we listened, you know, before lunch. And third uh, is, as you suggest, uh, this uh, North Korean crisis. And the uh, Prime Minister Abe is pretty, or his team entirely, is pretty good at uh, dealing with this international crisis, whereas, uh, the Japanese people still uh, clearly remember how terrible it was uh, under the DPJ government until you know, uh, 12, uh, 2012. Um, so compared to that, you know, uh, you know, Abe's uh, leadership in the international scene uh, looks pretty good, and uh, probably you know, uh, he is uh, doing pretty well. And that was probably the, the, the basis of the judgment of the public. You know. Do you Nobu see uh, Trump's ha uh, Abe's handling uh, the Washington situation as bringing him more political asset or, or, or otherwise? Well, I think the, the, the public understanding of the challenge, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you consider the challenge, mm -hmm. um, I think the public understanding of the Abe administration is very positive and how, how you deal with that. Um, especially if you compare it to what maybe the South Korea's difficulty with the United States, or maybe Australian difficulty with the United States. <laughs> I mean, if you have that kind of comparison, maybe the public will understand how good it has been, um, but it doesn't guarantee the future. So, I mean, but at this point, it, I think it's fair to say that, that he has gained a public support on that. Um, you know, uh, and um, like just an that, at an anecdote of North Korea, you know, there was a parliamentary session. The, the opposition party asked for, you know, how he deals with the crisis, and you know, everybody found out that he stayed in the prime minister's office before the missile launch. It's kind of the public sense that he does have good information in what is happening. So he's well informed. You know, he's doing the job. So I think the foreign policy part of our administration is, a, you know, currently it's a big plus for him. So coming back to the Korean crisis and, uh, you know, public diplomacy uh, on both sides suggests uh, that the United States and Japan and South Korea, for that matter, are at one on the management of the South Korean crisis. But uh, uh, you imply that uh, there is risk of divergence. Uh, what, what are the major risks uh, for Japan? in managing the North Korean crisis alongside the United States and for that matter alongside mm. South Korea and China. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of risks. Uh, first, uh, the risk of United States uh, making a deal with North Korea in a premature way. Um, so you know, for the United States, for some Americans, uh, uh, North Korea is a new problem because now uh, their uh, intercontinental ballistic missile reaches uh, the U.S. Uh, mainland. Uh, this is why they got alarmed very recently. But uh, for Japan, this has been more long-term chronic problem. And uh, so, you know, we don't like to see the United States making a deal just to stop the intercontinental long, you know, the ballistic missile. You know. uh, there's a, 
other more serious bunch of a lot of problems. Then there's a, a kind of premature uh, preemptive attack, you know, uh, being kind of a, a concerned, you know, because uh, well, uh, on the border of uh, south and north, uh, probably North Koreans have uh, 10,000 rockets that could hit Seoul any time. So there's always an enormous uh, risk for human casualties. So that is one of the risks. Then, you know, another one is uh, uh, Korea, the Republic of Korea, you know, you said that we have a one, but, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, Korean, uh, South Korea, the Republic of Korea is reluctant to confirm the threat from the north. And so they now are pretty, tend to be with, with US and Japan, but uh, sometimes uh, their position is shaky. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, we are still in a, in a risky kind of territory. You know. Uh, is that accord with your view of where you're at? Yes, uh, very much so. And, and I think just to add is uh, maybe we, we now are, um, we, like we recognize how much U.S.-China relations really matters in our security system as well. I mean, it, it is so obvious at this point that that's really the security uh, arrangement of the current, whether we like it or not. I mean, we, we consider this Asian regional order in terms of very much U.S.-Japan relationship, but it's not the U.S.-Japan relationship that, that matters in the security area, but it's now the U.S.-China relationship that matters. I think even though we, we knew by, you know, uh, in terms of readings and everything, but this, with this crisis, I mean, what, what is, you know, uh, reassured is, is that mm. fact of regional order. Amy, you like yeah, I mean, I very much agree, obviously, with the, the, the physical um, risk to Jap Japanese territory and, and populations and, and this question of Japan passing, I suppose, you know, the, that the US and China will reach some kind of deal that mm -hmm. overlooks Japanese or South Korean interests. I think another risk, though, for Japan is that it won't have, it doesn't have the relationship with China in place to manage or coordinate uh, any kind of joint response to the North Korean issue. And partly that's because of you know, the many, many issues in the bigger Japan-China relationship. But also because when you look at you know, Japanese defense policy um, and threat perceptions, it's North Korea and China that are the two key issues. And so Japanese increases in defense spending and shifts in, in military posture are to deal with both the North Korean issue and with China. And of course, that, that leads to quite considerable criticism from China, um, which is inhibiting the ability for Japan and China, I think, to um, to to work more closely together um, in resolving that key security tension. Now, I think you know Japan's uh, security moves are, are justified, um, are understandable given the threat that China has been posing in the East China Sea and, and elsewhere. Um, but we don't have that relationship in place to to talk about these really really difficult issues, to talk about what you know future Korean Peninsula might look like. Um, to, to envisage a, you know, a regional security order when you do have a more unstable uh, United States. Uh, and so uh, we, I think, are going to continue to see this real lack of coordination between Japan and China, uh, in addition to the concerns, obviously, about the United States and Japan uh, on this question. So the denouement of this thing, uh, however it's triggered, uh, would seem to require a really quite sophisticated framework for coordination and cooperation between all the major players in Northeast Asia, mm -hmm. Japan, China, mm -hmm. South Korea, and the United States. Uh, and uh, that's the worry, uh, because uh, apart from movement at the United Nations, wherein the work is done on sanctions, and intensification of sanctions, uh, that's not in place. That's not mm -hmm. in place at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what's Japan's interest in trying to uh, engineer that framework, position on that? Because, you know, whatever's done as the next step in this, mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, China succumbs and pulls a plug on all the supplies to North Korea, uh, that's not the end of it. Uh, mm -hmm. What's North Korea's response to that? North Korea's response to that could be to feel very much in a corner mm -hmm. and lash out mm -hmm. at South Korea or China or whatever. 
the analysts in the United States suggest that's the most likely outcome of that, not let alone in China. Mm. Uh, and then who manages uh, the consequences of that? And how, what's the framework for cooperation between the major players and managing the consequence of that? So uh, what's Japan's interest in engineering mm. this kind of framework? Yeah. First of all, uh, no, uh, United States uh, doesn't have a good uh, working relations uh, with China either you know, on this North Korea thing. Uh, Mr. Trump had a big expectation originally, like in April when he met Xi Jinping, but uh, now he understands that China will not work hard enough uh, to uh, satisfy the United States. Um, and you know, Japan will not have a big expectation on China either. You know. And uh, we have to defend our own territory. And uh, the defending our own territory uh, is kind of a, or a threat to our uh, own territory. Uh, it's the first experience uh, since 1945 to Japan. And uh, China is a big country. You know, its military spending is huge. And it's growing by the two double digit number. You know. So no. Uh, uh, we uh, cannot trust China on this. Um, and thinking about uh, the nuclear development by North Korea, you know, we have to understand that uh, they have some technical kind of expertise to develop uh, the uh, nuclear weapons, and they somehow got the money and uh, the materials to make the missile and the bombs. So there's no uh, kind of a, a panacea you know, to stop that. Um, and uh, any, there are sanctions, but the sanction will not work as they are uh, with the normal countries. You know, um, so uh, we have to be first of all very patient, very prepared, but patient. And uh, the new way, one of the kind of the new attempts, uh, what uh, what is called uh, the secondary boycott or secondary sanctions, mm -hmm. secondary boycott or secondary sanctions, uh, which is. Uh, you know, first tried uh, last fall by Obama administration in a very sm small scale, but uh, the, now the Trump administration is uh, enlarging that category of sanctions uh, you know, fairly dramatically, and the uh, Japanese government uh, now follows some of them. And uh, this sanction will be applied to uh, companies or individuals who that uh, deal uh, with that that, that did the uh, uh, commerce with the North Korean government, so that would include many small Chinese uh, individuals or small Chinese banks. Uh, that will that means that uh, there will be more confrontation between the United States and the Chinese government. And Obama administration was reluctant to do that because they. Uh, are not willing to uh, uh, worsen uh, their relation with China because they are, uh, they are hopeful that uh, China will be cooperative uh, in the climate change you know, uh, the program. But uh, the Trump uh, is not interested in climate change. So you know, he is pretty easy to uh, apply this new sanction against uh, Chinese companies and uh, you know, uh, individuals. So you know, this is, this has, ha these sanctions have not been Try in large scale, so it's worth, worth looking at, seeing to see these new measures uh, have some, uh, you know, uh, effect. Um, in Abe's position in all this is is, is interesting because you know uh, some of the conceptions of Abe at home and abroad are uh, well. If anything, he could be a bit trigger happy. Uh, he's got a, uh, a philosophical inclination uh, to support a strong military action. Uh, but your story suggests that at least uh, he's compliant in uh, and perhaps actively leading a much more cautious approach mm -hmm. on North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that, is that how you yeah, what uh, the, uh, the the Japanese government is uh, really doing is applying under sanctions and strengthening them. So I think that's still the basis of the Japan's policy. And to be with the United States is also uh, another thing to be, which is very important to Japan. You know.
But the judgment is that these sanctions are uh, sufficiently wide, including uh, broader and deeper sanctions from China, are going to be successful in constraining North Korean nuclearization or not. Is that the judgment? I think un unsuccessful. So to date, they've yeah. not been successful, uh, and I don't think yeah. there's any evidence that they that, that will change North Korea's yeah. position. Um, that it, North Korea's m most recent statement about the nuclear test and the ICBM test very much demonstrated that they have been able to, do, to achieve all of this yeah. despite very harsh sanctions. Um, if anything, tighter sanctions will actually reduce Chinese leverage uh, over North Korea. So the objective is really to to get a broadly based negotiation with North Korea. I mean, that's the real objective. Yeah. In 1946 uh, or 47, when the United States saw the aggressive uh, Soviet Union, you know, it didn't go to war, uh, except Korean war. You know, it was started by North Korea. But, uh, so the United States didn't initiate the war, but uh, contained the United States uh, with a lot of patience. Uh, they never thought that uh, it took like uh, 40 or 50 years, you know. But uh, it was, so, you know, we, we need some degree of Patience, you know. Um, so this uh, is the immediate yeah, problem. Yeah. Uh, it sits in the context of bigger changes taking mm -hmm. place in the region, including uh, the rise and increased importance of, of China. Uh, however, China, however powerful China is, uh, it clearly got some problems with managing North Korea mm -hmm. uh, and uh, managing other things as well, including the. Uh, uh, U.S. relationship, although it was quite confident about managing the Trump administration in the early phases of this, uh, I think that confidence has been corroded somewhat over the last several months. And one of the possibilities uh, uh, you uh, mentioned earlier was that a collateral consequence of the management of the North Korean problem will be uh, separate. Uh, action by the United States on trade policy against China because China in some way has failed to fulfill uh, the promise of reigning North Korea mm -hmm. back in, whatever the benchmark was there. Uh, how does Japan view all that? Uh, Mr. Trump uh, suggested a kind of a new brand new sanction against China for being uh, a trade partner with North Korea, but uh, that would mean a devastating uh, loss to the U.S. exporters too. So that sounds very rational or smart. So this might be just a bluff, but uh, I don't know, you know, his threat to withdraw from NAFTA might be real, and uh, uh, that is also might be the case uh, with the uh, US-Japan uh, FTA course. So this is the thing uh, that is very un unpredictable about uh, Mr. Trump. And so you know, uh, we'll have a, a negotiation on economics and trade with the United States uh, late this year. And uh, you know, we are not very optimistic you know, about that. And, uh, we like to see more balanced, more nuanced, and more sophisticated, you know, uh, uh, expression of a U.S. intention, you know. Well, coming to the economic dimension of uh, the geopolitical arrangements across Asia and the Pacific, uh, uh, as you say, uh, you know, Trump's discarded TPP. Uh, Abe himself had a huge stake in TPP. And I think uh, Foreign Minister Bishop mentioned this morning he'd taken at uh, Germany's diet gratification and so on uh, at significant political cost. He had a huge stake in TPP as a part of the US pivot to Asia and part of the framework for securing uh, Japan's interest in rebalancing against the rise of China. Uh, where's Abe at now on that? What does that look like in Japan? As a, well, yes, uh, as you uh, rightly framed, I think those two things like tied together, like one is the American uh, backed security system in Asia and also like the TPP, the liberal democratic order of both economics and politics. I think those two were the environment that the Japan has been associated and identified it within the region. Right? Um, and, and the toolkit was always the economic cooperation to, to advance that, that um, values and systems. 
But now with the, with the United States being questioned with this um, you know, liberal democratic order and also the emergence of, for example, Chinese model of economic cooperation, which is not the, uh, the liberal democratic principle per se. And also if you look at other countries in Asia, like in Southeast Asia, you have different, you know, coming like Thailand being coup d'etat. You know, it's not the democratic wave that we expected in the 80s that, that reached to, and that spreads the region, but it's the otherwise. Um, so, so it's now the, the Japanese are at the crossroads. So these like three pillars: the U.S. security, the liberal democratic order, and the economic cooperation. So I think these three has to be like reconfigurated, and with that, that's why the U.S. security system really matters. Because if if the liberal democratic order and economic cooperation has to do without the U.S. Uh, security system, which is like the TPP-11. Um, I think that's the new challenge in whether Japan will associate more on this principle or more geostrategic identification. I think that's what the Prime Minister is now trying to choose in, in seeking a new kind of identification of Japan. So I think now it's very much a critical situation. Yeah, a little bit more into that. I mean, uh, TPP, of course, uh, Critically, uh, TP12 critically depended on the centrality of the US to the arrangements with each of the parties yes. in the TPP. Yes. Essentially, it was a series of bilateral free trade agreements negotiated from Washington. Mm. Uh, and with TPP11, what's left in that uh, for Japan? Why does Japan hang on to that so desperately uh, when the core of it's missing? It's a bit like the core, if the core of the alliance, security alliance relationship uh, with Australia uh, and Japan from Washington were missing, then the Australia-Japan uh, relationship would have to be reconceived in order to be effective, as was discussed in the, in the session earlier this morning. Uh, so why does Japan hang on to that so desperately? I think uh, one thing is very much like um, if you if you have a a kind of tension between this, this liberal order vis-a-vis -vis the security system. And um, you, you, you really have to kind of find a, a new equilibrium between the two. And I think um, like Japan has been identified, uh, you know, um, for example, a lot of political strategy in Asia especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis United States. We are not just a junior partner, but we are like the agent state you know, the leading Asian development state, uh, developed state. But now I think one of the key is it, it's not always the U.S. that has a mirror to identify Japan, but also with uh, China as well. The China, you have to identify yourself, differentiate from China. And I think that's one very important part. You know, before it was you have to differentiate from the United States, but now you, you really have to differentiate from China. So I think that's where Japan always tried to find your identity identification and I, th I think this uh, TPP 11 you, you still cling on to the liberal mm. democratic principle despite of US despite of China I think that's where the, the Japanese are trying yeah, to find China, China is a huge part yeah. of uh, yeah. Japan's external economic yeah, relationships yeah. it's the biggest trading yeah. partner yeah. Yeah. so would you do that separately from China in this context or um, I, I think there's there's no way to to exclude that possibility um, but, but how, um, that's mm. a, a, still a big, uh, big open question right now. Mm. Yeah. 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 Uh, in fact, uh, the TPP uh, had uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, strategic aspects. Uh, you know, you have to honor uh, the intellectual property rights. You have to be, you have to honor the non-discrimination principle for the domestic companies and foreign companies, and the government cannot be part of the private entities like PLA, part of the company. And so, you know, some of the clauses are clearly, you know, uh, anti-China you know, or Chinese practice of uh, uh, economy. So uh, this is why, you know, I said that the TPP had uh, clearly a lot of uh, important strategic uh, aspects. That is why Japan and the United States and perhaps Australia uh, were very enthusiastic to, you know, uh, accomplish this. And uh, actually, you know, President Obama uh, tried to persuade uh, the hawkish Republican uh, member of the Congress by 
you know, stressing this aspect uh, a little bit too late. <laughs> but you know. so uh, I think you know for Japan uh, just to have a, a free trade agreement or free trade agreement zone is important. But uh, I think this uh, strategic aspect is even more you know important. And for Japan recently you know uh, we uh, uh, negotiations with uh, the EU over EU Japan EPA has progressed. And uh, there's a prospect for us to complete uh, the negotiation with EU. And so, uh, for the time being, uh, this uh, Japan EU EPA uh, might symbolize uh, this high standard, you know, uh, world uh, trade system. Then, of, of course, we have a big uh, expectation that the TPP 11 uh, will be implement, uh, implemented uh, pretty soon. We are in a totally different world though now on, on, on trade policy uh, because uh, uh, of the range of the raft of actions that Trump has threatened. He has the power to implement. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not constrained mm -hmm. by con Congress in many of these things. Mm -hmm. He's threatened to tear up chorus mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, so, you know, holding on to TPP and letting it sit there mm -hmm. Uh, while well, uh, this all evolves, is hardly a strategic response mm. to what's coming out of Washington that threatens the underlying political and economic security system of the international trade regime. So, uh, you know, how can Japan reposition in that respect? Because if all of us, Australia included for that matter, uh, are to define the game in a way that protects the international trade regime and our economic and political security within that, including with China, which is a huge mm -hmm. part of both yours yeah. and our trade relationships, yeah. uh, then uh, we've got to uh, take proactive action to protect that system. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what you want to come in on this? Yeah, point? I mean, I think actually Abe has been quite strategic here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in June he made this very significant speech where he set out his vision. Um, of, an, of the dream for Asia, and, and talked mm. not about only the TPP-11, but also about ASEP, about the Japan-EU partnership, mm. but also about China's Belt and Road Initiative, um, as all parts of um, the sort of centrality of Asia in an open international economic order. Now, of course, you know, there are reservations in Japan, and Abe made those reservations about some aspects of, of what China is proposing with uh, Belt and Road, and. Uh, and AIAB and other things. Um, but I thought it was quite significant that he went as far as he did um, and, and sent you know, the LDP Secretary General to the, the Belt and Road Forum, um, which was very much celebrated in China, um, to sort of suggest that, that China, Japan was willing to play that, that quite traditional role that Japan has always played of extending cooperation with China on these sorts of economic initiatives. And, actually fostering China's engagement um, in the regional economy. And I think this is part of Japan's wider interest in, as you say, keeping the regional and global international economic order open and stable in the face of, of so much um, shift uh, in Europe and North America and in the shape of all this sort of rising protectionism. Um, now, you know, there's a long way to go before we see what that, what that actually looks like and, and the extent of Japan-China uh, economic cooperation um, on that aspect. But I think that was quite a significant turning point. Well, I'm actually just going to ask you about that. That's <laughs> an anticipated <laughs> point. So, um, what you imply is that Japan is beginning to articulate a very broad strategic response to that set of issues in Asia and uh, moving to a, uh, a subtle but, but clear hedging strategy on, on this with China. Is that what you're saying? I think that's right. I mean, I think it is subtle. I mean, I don't think we're seeing a complete game change here uh, by any means. Um, and in fact, I think what we're seeing is Japan, as I said, sort of returning to this sort of traditional hedging, hedging role of engaging with China on the one hand, but also playing that very important role of constraining uh, what it sees as some of the worst aspects of China's behaviour in terms of the South China Sea, the East China Sea. Japan was reasonably vocal on the India-China border dispute, for example. Um, so it's, it's playing that dual role. Um, the big change, though, is historically Japan has played that dual role with the US-Japan alliance as the backstop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's been the United States that could be relied upon to be the chief arbiter mm -hmm. on all of these issues, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was the North Korean nuclear issue or the South China Sea mm -hmm. or even the East China Sea. I mean, the, the US was essentially um, you know, that, that chief arbiter. Now, mm -hmm. if that 
if there are questions being raised about the US role in Japan, mm. that could, I think, pretend a much more significant shift. So we're in this, I think, interesting phase now of, of waiting to see where the US-Japan alliance goes mm. where, and principally where the US role in Asia goes. Well, you'd want to see as a complement to that much more active engagement with like-minded countries such as Australia, wouldn't you, right. uh, if it was going to be successful. Otherwise, uh, yeah, we're guessing about it rather than we can rely on it. And it would have to be considerably more significant engagement. I mean, the sort of cooperation around the edges won't be enough. Uh, I mean, the US-Japan alliance was really, as, as you said, the principal agent of, of US forward posture in Asia. Um, this this so, is an idea that uh, Yoichi Funabashi yeah, exactly. articulated in an article mm -hmm. here. I don't know if you've read that. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't, but... but, uh, but uh, do you, you see things as Amy sees them? Well, I tend to think uh, that uh, the good old days of uh, US-China engagement uh, may not be coming back uh, unless until China stops uh, its uh, uh, pro provocative uh, activities uh, within the Japanese territorial you know, waters you know, uh, around Senkaku. And, uh, and it still happens uh, on a regular basis, uh, like uh, every week, close to, or 0 0.7 days a week, you know, uh, uh, they stayed you know, in the Japanese territorial water. And uh, you know, they are kind of, uh, the number of the vessels are increasing. You know. So, you know, but at the same time, uh, there's a talk uh, that a Chinese leadership might change uh, their policy towards Japan slightly, you know, in, uh, in a better way. So we have to be, you know, be alert uh, to see the new opportunities. But uh, overall, I'm not uh, very optimistic to see the good old days uh, coming back. And about uh, the free trade between Japan and China, it would be pretty easy for Japan to lower the tariffs, you know, reciprocally. But uh, for Japan, it is, even, uh, it is more important to uh, establish a kind of a quality, high standard you know, uh, free trade agreement, uh, touching upon other uh, government involvement uh, in the private businesses. Well, that's yeah. part of the, that is part of the ASEAN negotiation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. in East Asia, as for Vietnam, and Vietnam mm -hmm. was uh, let off the hook on that, mm -hmm. uh, GDP. Yeah. Uh, it's a long-term game, or longer-term mm -hmm. game, rather than a game yeah. that can be fixed yeah. very quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but Azar, uh, what about you? Yeah, I will, I will take a little bit of a different aspect. I think the, the way Japan and the United States has, has worked together in, in both in terms of economic uh, orders and, and the security order was much more into domestic politics as well. So I think that aspect convinced, um, which is the politics of productivity. So it's, it's really the politics all about economic development, you know, it's production. And I think China was actually the resounding success in terms of you know, convincing it's the, it's the development, it's the economics that is the important key politics. And if you think the foreign policy begins at home, you know, uh, kind of uh, rhetoric, I think that's where Japan still plays a role. Um, it's not maybe the territorial issue per se, or it's not the FTA negotiations per se, but but addressing these uh, internal issues, not just in China, but other parts in Asia as well. Everybody's struggling with inequality. You know, how, how do you overcome that inequality and how Japan overcome that inequality? Um, how do you deal with this kind of social and public um, system? I think that plays another new role in addressing a kind of political standard that creates the, the region uh, or at least minimize the risk of the collapse of this liberal and security order. So I think that's where, you know, if you think back to history, this, this idea of purpose of, you know, politics is the productivity, the economic development. I think that's not gone yet. It, it, it's, it's still there. And there are many talks between, you know, the Chinese, for example, uh, the regional leaders with the Japanese uh, regional leaders as well. Everybody cooperates in, in so many ways. Um, despite of the territorial issues. So I think that's a positive sign. And, and I think those communications do kind of plays well to give a, a, a strong platform. Yeah, I, I, don't, I can't predict how many years it takes, but it, it is a positive platform that I can think of. Yeah. Look, I'm going to put one more question to you all and then throw it open to the audience to <coughs> tease a conversation out as, as uh, your interests dictate. Uh, 
comes back to where Japan's thinking at is uh, at grassroots on some of these strategic interests. Uh, you know, Abe's had this long time burning ambition, as it were, uh, to make Japan a normal country uh, and uh, revise Article 9 of the Constitution. Uh, there's, there's these, do these circumstances that Japan faces now make that more or less likely uh, uh, than, than it might have been? My point of view first. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> You know, his uh, approval ratings used to be very high, but uh, sunk uh, remarkably uh, like uh, three months ago, two months ago. So given uh, his uh, current low approval ratings, which is a little bit uh, coming back, but still uh, it may not be easy for him to deliver the, the amendment uh, of Article 9. Uh, although, uh, you know, the international environment uh, warrants uh, the, the, the change uh, in a constitutional you know, arrangement, you know, this is my thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, the interesting thing was that if we compare the public opinion poll between April and August about North Korea, what should the public expect? Is it the economic stronger economic sanctions or diplomatic negotiations or a military action? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the interesting part is that um, it's more clean, uh, leaning to more diplomatic negotiation and the ratio of supporting the military action is uh, almost the same or lesser. So even though there's more missiles, you know, missiles and, and nuclear testing, the public opinion really has a negative or uh, a view on, for example, military action. And that, that kind of a public opinion gives a, a, a private Minister Abe, a very difficult situation, especially in changing the Article 9 um, in the constitutional you know, change. So the time is, I think, it's against <laughs> right now. <laughs> are you a view on this, Amy? I think there are two actually opposing pressures on Japan at the same time, which makes predicting this really difficult. Um, although I think yeah. I would defer to the domestic, the domestic difficulties of actually getting this passed um, mm -hmm. are, are pretty, pretty <laughs> profound. Um, but you know whether or not they can actually change Article Nine, there is the broader question of you know increasing shifts and reinterpretation and all the rest of it on, on military posture. I think the first sort of opposing one force is uh, obviously the deteriorating international security environment uh, and questions about the reliability of the U.S. alliance, uh, or both of which would suggest we would like to see a more likely to see a more active, more normal Japan. Um, the opposite force, though, is the question of China. Um, and in an environment in which you need to work, which Japan needs to work much more closely with China to deal with issues like North Korea, uh, if it's facing a, a more unreliable US ally, China is going to be the most vocal opponent uh, to Japan doing these sorts of things in terms of Article 9. So that would you know, push in the other direction. So I think it's, yeah, the prediction is very, very difficult, unfortunately. Okay, well, let's take questions and comments from our audience. Uh, uh, first up the back here. I know I was a speaker earlier, you've probably heard enough from me, but I've been dying to ask a question about tactical nuclear weapons. <laughs> um, so one of the things that's interesting uh, about Donald Trump is he asks us to, uh, to reflect on some of our, some of our uh, status quo biases, or certainly that's, certainly that's the case uh, with myself. Um, during the Cold War, the ongoing concern of the Europeans was whether the United States would be willing to escalate, given the ability of the Soviet Union to strike the continental United States with a, with a nuclear weapon. Um, this is exactly the situation that we are close to walking into in Northeast Asia today. If uh, North Korea doesn't yet have the ability to miniaturize a thermonuclear weapon and hit the United States, probably within Trump's first term, um, that, that likelihood uh, will, will, will uh, eventuate. Um, and in, uh, in September of 2016, the Asahi uh, Shimbun reported that South, South Korean officials uh, had asked, uh, raised the idea of nuclear sharing, which was one you know, NATO response to that problem. 
Um, that is positioning ta U.S. tactical nuclear weapons in South Korea in order to give the South Koreans some degree of control over escalation. Um, so my question uh, is uh, is to Mr. Kubo, and, uh, Professor Kubo in particular, but also the other panelists. What do you think Tokyo's response would be to uh, a nuclear sharing arrangement between uh, the Trump administration, that is the, new, the United States, and uh, South Korea, uh, that is tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula, uh, with some with control retained by the U.S. And do you think one response to that might be? For to that Tokyo might also ask for uh, U.S. Uh, uh, nuclear weapons to be stationed in Japan, recognizing that that already happened during the Cold War in Okinawa. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very uh, important and uh, serious uh, question. Uh, related to the, uh, I read uh, Walter Russell Mead's uh, essay this morning, uh, which is on the Australian paper, which said that uh, Japan's uh, nuclearization uh, is uh, inevitable. You know. uh, but, uh, you know, uh, thinking about uh, the, uh, the national feelings, uh, susceptibilities about uh, the nuclear weapons of the Japanese people, I don't think uh, that uh, Japan will accept uh, to have a nuclear weapon uh, on Japan's soil. Uh, that would include uh, the uh, sharing of uh, nuclear weapons like with the United States or Korea. Uh, no, the anti-nuclear weapon uh, uh, feeling uh, are so strong. Uh, when uh, China uh, was about to have a nuclear weapon in early 1960s, uh, Prime Minister Sato thought about uh, that option for Japan to have uh, nuclear weapons too, but uh, he gave it up. Uh, probably he thought that uh, there would be no merit, and instead there would be uh, uh, assurance from the United States. And uh, recently, uh, uh, in uh, Japan-US uh, security dialogue, uh, Japan uh, sought uh, kind of a guarantees of extended deterrence from the United States. And uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you think about uh, it's really kind of a guaranteed, uh, no one could be sure. But uh, well, probably the Japanese government policy will be to depend on the extended uh, the, uh, deterrence uh, from the United States. And the Japanese public uh, will never uh, accept uh, uh, to have uh, nuclear weapons uh, in Japan, they will kind of never vote for the political party who advocate uh, having a nuclear weapons. This is my feeling. You know. I mean, I think the, the bigger question, is, of course, is would tactical nuclear weapons actually resolve or, or have any <coughs> role to play here? I mean, I think the research by people like Daryl Press is that <coughs> there is no, solu no tactical nuclear solution <coughs> to the North Korean issue. Um, largely for reasons of geography. So I'm not sure, uh, taking the question of whether or not Japan and South Korea actually want to go down that path, whether it would succeed in deterring North Korea. Uh, Do you want to add anything, Norbert? Yes, um, I think the, the difference between Russia and the United States, and in this case with North Korea, is this sheer lack of information about North Korea. I mean, how, how much... Uh, we share the calculus of the damage, you know, how, how much we uh, have the uh, same understanding of the damage, you know, it's, it's not really so sure. I mean, we, we might, you know, uh, have a very negative view on the North Korean leader to its nation. So, I mean, if that's the case, I mean, it tactically doesn't work. I mean, this deterrence idea has to have this kind of information, uh, I mean, or the sharing of understanding of the damage, but I think that, we, because we are not that sure, we are not sure that and having a nuclear sharing kind of guarantees like what Amy said will have a positive strategic impact. So if we are not sure about that, you know, it's very difficult to make a political choice because it's very difficult to convince this is the ultimate uh, uh, way to go. Peter McCoy. Thanks very much. Addressing the question of Japan in a global order, uh, I'd like to ask a slightly broader question about Japan's role in Asia. Looking beyond China, 
looking to South Asia, looking to Southeast Asia, looking across Asia. For 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, for a long time, Japan has had a vision of itself as a leader of Asia. It goes back, for example, to the article by Akamatsu in the Flying Geese paradigm. Now, it would appear that right now, uh, this seems to be fairly suddenly under challenge. It's under challenge from two points of view. First of all, China, of course, is becoming much more powerful. And second, we now have this immediate crisis in North Korea, which at the very least is distracting Korea, Japan, at the very least. So my question really is, looking at the global order, where does all of this leave, looking at in a broader sweep, where does this leave Japan's role across the sweep of Asia? Is Japan losing its, in this global order, is Japan losing its position of leadership uh, in, in Asia? I think that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, it's, it's both yes and no. Uh, maybe if you focus on the kind of <coughs> quantity of economic power that Japan has, that's, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's relatively being challenged, and it's, uh, it's, it's much more uh, smaller than it was like in the uh, late 80s and the early 90s, of course, that's true. Um, but I think the challenge is not just about China, but I think in a broader sense, which I already mentioned, it's really the idea of you know development. You know how development, you know, benefits to each and every society of Asia. And if that model that Japan has is convincing, I think they still have a, a normative power to that. But I think the challenge is here is uh, because of the inequality, the gap between the top and the bottom, um, because the middle class is now struggling. The middle class cannot dream for the upper echelon of the society. And, and the middle, lower middle class is very much suffering toward the lower part. And so how are you going to convince with the idea of development, the current idea of development in that kind of social dynamics? Um, the, the key solution that some country has is, for example, use religion, like Islam. So, so there are a lot of countries, these all Islam network is more convincing. It's not about the economic development, but it's because it's more your, your kind of standard of living, which it's not like the American style or the Japanese style, but it's the Islamic style of living standard you have to go for when you are suffering in the current situation at the development cell system. So I think those, you know, those identity politics creeping in every part of Asia, not just about the uh, Islam, but many other uh, religion, ethnicity, you know, broadly speaking, nationalism. Um, I think those are the challenges that will hinder this idea of development, which, it, which was the Japanese um, kind of um, standard of advancing its values and, uh, and politics in Asia, and which make the Asia leaders. So um, I think now it's pretty much the time that uh, it's not really about this geopolitical, but in, inside these social dynamics, I think that the Japanese has to address the issues, and especially like make sure that you know, the lower part of the population has a hope in its society about their development model. Um, you know, don't go for identity politics, but go with the economics. I think whether Japan can propose that social system, I think that will make a fundamental you know, difference in, in the future ahead for Japan. What, 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 what instruments or what mechanisms uh, are there through which Japan can, uh, can help to address that, that kind of challenge? Yes, I think it's very much healthcare and education. I think uh, health and education really... I mean diplomatic instruments. Diplomatic. Well, even diplomatically still, I think environment, he health, and, and environment, health, education, I think these components in arranging like cooperations, not just big infrastructure. So, so you see it mainly, largely, as Japan's bilateral national diplomacy, not, not, not... It could be bilateral, it could be regional as well. You set a standard, a regional standard of so environment. So again, I just, you just uh, try to pin you down. What mechanisms can Japan use regionally to address these issues? Do we need new mechanisms? Can Japan create new mechanisms? Is the ADB or some other instrumentality going to be the mechanism? I think the current mechanism does work in a certain way, but also we, we need more actors to be 
involved in this. Maybe mm -hmm. one actor I can pinpoint is this local government. Um, you know, the local government, the urban governance mm -hmm. system that Japan has is, is quite a model. Um, so uh, when you talk about governance, it's not just about national <laughs> governance with the urbanization rising in Asia. Like urbanization is the biggest social dynamic in Asia now, 50% plus is living in the urban arena. And how, how, you, how you manage a, a population of a million plus, where there's so many million plus cities, is a, the size is very different from the European model. I mean, you used to have a European model of urban governance, you talk about livability and everything, about healthcare, education, everything. But if you have multiple million plus cities, how are you gonna manage that? I think there's a way. So let's involve new actors. Um, in terms of, it could be in ADB settings, or, but this local governance expertise, I think that's a, a very good you know, uh, tool that Japan has to make sure it's positioned in Asia. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a very important uh, question. Certainly, uh, Japan cannot say that uh, Japan is the economically most powerful country in Asia any longer, but uh, the thing is that whether you are on the side of uh, destabilizing or destroying the current international order or, or whether you are on the side of maintaining or protecting the current international order and Japan stands on the latter position whereas China may not and uh, so you know we have a, in addition we have a, some soft power you know uh, Japan is probably still more egalitarian society than the uh, United States or some of the European countries. Or uh, quality of food is pretty good, the streets are safe and you know, um, pretty clean. And so you know, uh, combined with uh, this kind of a newly acquired uh, soft power with a uh, commitment to maintain the current international order with uh, the new set of foreign policy, which is called proactive uh, contribution to peace. You know, uh, we are hopeful that uh, you know uh, Japan still have uh, its own uh, identity. You know, in Asia. Good. Uh, and another question. Thank you very much for your discussion. And my question is, I think the country, the most important situation for Japan is the North Korea issue. And uh, China, on the other hand, want to uh, uh, focus on some the, uh, diplomatic approach or the dialogue to resolve the situation under the current situation. And I think, um, so is there any, does China has a, in incentive to catch kind of such kind of situation now to um, to want to change Japanese like the uh, stance to like do in uh, to change their uh, interpretation for the Article Nine or uh, make the uh, military force and if so, is there really affect Japanese attitude for that? Maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, big question. Um, so I think you sort of you, you situate Japan and China on opposite sides in some ways of the response to this issue. Um, I think the reality is that there there aren't too many options other than diplomacy and, and talking to, to deal with this issue um, and thinking about the, uh, greater deterrent strategies, I suppose, for North Korea. Um, this is ultimately going to be, I think, an issue where we. It's going to be impossible to remove, very, very difficult, I think, to remove North Korea's nuclear weapons from it. Um, there's very little that the rest of the world can offer North Korea to give up those nuclear weapons. Um, and so ultimately, this is going to be a situation that has to be managed um, between the various players in the region uh, through diplomacy, uh, through talking, through much more active engagement with North Korea, as unpalatable and difficult as that may be. Um, and it, it will be difficult. Um, so, you know, I don't think the North Korean situation will fundamentally shift Japan's military posture um, any more than it already has done. I mean, I think Japan, is, as we've, we've heard already, has been living with this situation for a long time now um, and has uh, reinterpreted its constitution, has, you know, for, for the last decade and a half, been doing a lot more in the military space. Um, 
to deal with the North Korean threat, uh, particularly in terms of things like missile defence. So I suspect we'll see more of that incrementalism rather than a, a sudden shift in, in Japanese posture. The other side of it, I mean, uh, the incentives for China to resolve this issue. Yeah. I mean, there's no way in the world that China wants a nuclear arm North Korea on its doorstep, is there? There's not, absolutely. Yeah. China doesn't want to see that. But also, the, China has other priorities. Um, one, it doesn't want to see the collapse of the North Korean regime, uh, partly because of the, the refugee instability, but I think more importantly, because of the question of what comes down, down the line. If you have the collapse of the North Korean uh, regime, reunification potentially under a US aligned South Korean government, that's very destabilizing for China. Uh, having a US aligned government right on China's borders hasn't you know, served China so well in the past. Invasions to China have, have come through that border with North Korea. So we have to be able to provide incentives to, to China as well. Uh, and here is where we might need some creative thinking by Japan, uh, in particular about how you provide those sorts of incentives. Um, uh, did your question include uh, the possibility of the, the, the Japan changing the Article 9? Well, you know, it's still kind of a possibility and doable, but uh, there are a couple of conditions, like uh, Abe's uh, approval rates uh, going about like 50 or 50, even 55 percent, you know, currently like it's uh, like below 45, you know. Then, you know, if he's uh, uh, support rate uh, goes up enough, uh, he might dissolve the parliament and uh, you know, make a bid, uh, the bet. Uh, then, you know, still, you, know, you have to, he has to uh, persuade uh, many uh, members of his own party, you know, Liberal Democratic Party. There are some politicians who are uh, not, you know, enthusiastic about amending the Article 9. He has to uh, persuade uh, his coalition partner, Komeito, you know, uh, which might be pretty difficult. So there are a couple of hurdles, but, uh, you know, uh, if his uh, support rate, you know, uh, come back, uh, then there's some possibility. Time for a couple more questions before we wrap it up. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for the interesting discussion. Um, if the crisis, current North Korean crisis escalates, or even if it doesn't, and Trump follows through on trade sanctions against China, as he's promised, um, what's going to be the response in Japan? What is the political inclination um, by Abe and the government? And what is public opinion going to tell us might happen? Will it, there'll be a lot of pressure on Japan to follow suit be close to its ally, America, and secure the alliance, put the geopolitics above the economics, put sanctions on China, um, or what might be the story? Uh, why don't you have a go at that? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> well if, if, I mean, if the, uh, the trend, what we see now, especially if you follow uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga's remarks, um, I mean, he will follow, you know, I mean, he, his idea is to expand the you know, um, the scope of sanctions. So, I mean, in, in that line, I mean, it's, it's more understandable that will you know, come. But, um, of course, the worrying sign is from the economic, the industrial, I mean, the, the economic voice. Um, I'm sure the, you know, with the heightened tensions of security, you know, the Japanese, <coughs> you know, uh, stock exchange market and going down, you know, you, you have all these kind of negative effects on Japanese economy. And so I think it's, it's, we are trying to find a, a kind of a point that's that's going to meet, I, and I cannot, I cannot tell to what scope, I mean, to what extent the scope, uh, or where where's the line? Is it the banking system or is it the trading system? I'm not very sure. Now we have the, the a certain banks that has already a trade deal, I mean, uh, relationship with North Korea being sanctioned. I mean, you know, the, those <coughs> assets are frozen now. So um, logical answer is yes. You know, the Japanese will follow the economic sanction. And the public opinion for economic sanction is not that bad, um, but but the voice from the you know the economic sector is another you know factor. So um, the, the easy question is, you know, it will follow through with the United States, but to what extent? Uh, it really depends on how much, because our stake at China is is very big as well. So yeah. 
Uh, what, what kind of uh, uh, economic sanctions uh, against China by United States uh, do you have in mind? Is it trade. sanction based on uh, the trade uh, act of like a 301, uh, Article 301, or it's a larger scale sanction for China because China still have a trade with North Korea? You've no, no, outlined the spectrum. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, so there's one section for mm -hmm, yeah. trade. Well, in case of the sanctions based on 301, uh, Japan uh, would be pretty quiet but uh, work very hard not to not persuading, try to persuade US uh, officials or US TR officials not to do that with Japan. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've, uh, been, you've been through that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, uh, the larger scale sanction, you no, know, based on the fact that uh, China still uh, has uh, trade with North Korea, that's a really remarkable thing, you know, if you, the United States really do that. So that's a kind of uh, the beyond my imagination, but, uh, well, we'd be surprised to see that. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's one more question, mm -hmm. yes. Ben? Uh, ben Ashier and Annie. So we've talked, you've talked about the need to amend Article 9 because of the deteriorating uh, regional situation, but what sort of amendment specifically in cognitive would be most beneficial, keeping in mind a balance between the need to respond to the new realities of the regional environment on the one hand, um, and a balance with uh, avoiding uh, exacerbating the security dilemma, uh, particularly like with, with China and South Korea's possible reactions to amendments of Article 9. You know, what's the most useful amendment, you know, shifting the line from the most recent changes that have opened up uh, limited forms of collective self-defense? But where does the line go beyond that in the, in the most ideal terms? Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, well, no, uh, in a limited uh, cases, uh, uh, based on the newly uh, legislated the Security uh, Act, you know, uh, we can uh, exert a uh, correct light of self-defense even now. But uh, you know, there are many ways, uh, many proposals to change you know, the, the actual wordings of Article 9. And the most uh, recent one proposed by Prime Minister Abe himself uh, was uh, to add that uh, the, in spite of the uh, Articles, you know, were said uh, before. Uh, Japan can have a self-defense force, you know, uh, which is pretty simple. But uh, many constitutional scholars uh, hate that proposal. And so, but sometimes, you know, there there'll be no perfect way to, you know, uh, satisfy everyone uh, in this kind of uh, the controversy. Um, and the timing is now pretty important. So uh, my sense is that uh, the sooner the better. And uh, this simple one might be pretty good. Uh, although you know, acknowledging that, that there are still many you know, uh, constitutional controversies left. Uh, yeah, this is my yeah, uh, interpretation. Yes. Well, uh, I have a similar view. It's, uh, I don't know what's going to be the best. <laughs> it's a very different, you know, this legal discussion and the strategic discussion is very different right now. I think the, 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 the legal consistency is now kind of uh, has its own politics and the strategic side, like you, this, the pressing strategic issue is like the gray zone, you know, issues, not really the one who who we are discussing in the constitutional, I mean, the legal discussion. So, so there's this gap here, um, you know, what we need to be done in, in our security uh, capability and what we needs to be done in the legal framework. So, so that's, that's making, I think, the discussions very difficult. I think we, we could have done a, a much more easier, like, change, maybe not amending, but with the, with the um, um, you know, the kind of understanding of the constitution by, enabling not just the um, collective self-defense but the gray zone mm -hmm. so 
um, that's that's the difficult part. I mean, and and the difficult or the the unfortunate thing is that the prime minister's political cap, uh, no, capital being sucked by the legal side uh, is the unfortunate thing because what is pressing more is more into uh, you know prepare for this gray zone you know uh, security threat. So. Um, just very briefly, I mean, I very much agree with that point about the grey zone being the, the issue um, that's critical for Japan to be able to deal with right now. Um, to then sort of bigger question about reaching that balance that perhaps China might accept or at least not find too problematic. Unfortunately, I don't think there is much that Japan could do in terms of actual revision to the constitution uh, that China would find acceptable. I mean, it's been so critical up till now. Um, and so willing to call Japan out for you know, revisionism and remilitarization uh, that I don't think it's, China hasn't given itself much room to move um, should Japan go down that path. So I uh, suspect it's be something that Japan will have to do despite complaints from the region. Uh, can I add one thing from a domestic perspective of Japan? Uh, for uh, you know, the kids from elementary school to middle school to high school are taught that uh, the uh, self-defense force is supposed to be against the constitution and it is not the military, but uh, it is a military in the, the ordinary definition of the world. So um, this is very confusing uh, situation for uh, kids, for students, for youngsters. Um, as far as there is uh, uh, Article 9, in the current form, you know, we have to keep uh, this uh, you know, confusing situation. So you know, uh, that's one thing for that one more case for a constitutional amendment. Good, well, uh, I know there are other questions I know, but I'm, uh, we'll have to take them out outside the session. <laughs> uh, I just want to wrap it up uh, in the last few minutes or so. I mean, one of the things that I think uh, I take away from this conversation is that uh, in all these new circumstances, Japan hasn't been standing still. Uh, there's, it may be nascent, but there's an act of diplomacy developing to respond. You are with us. Hmm? You are with us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it hasn't been said. <laughs> well, possibly. Uh, and uh, the last question to you all, then, is, you know, in all these area issues that we've been talking about. Uh, in which of them and how can Japan make a difference, do you think, a real difference to the outcome? So if you take uh, the rise of China, you know, what's uh, China, uh, Japan's uh, most effective strategy there? If you take, uh, um, you know, the threat to the global order or, or, or the Korean crisis, Choose anyone you like. How can Japan make a difference? Will be argued. Oh, that's a <laughs> sudden, very surprising question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for Japan, uh, the pressing, uh, you know, the issue is whether you know we can survive uh, this uh, North Korean threat. And uh, no, probably, you know, we can make some difference by telling Americans don't go so fast and uh, you need uh, some patience, you know, um, because we've been patient enough for a long time. And also, you know, uh, as I said, this is uh, Japan's first uh, experience uh, to be, you know, threatened, you know, by neighbor, you know, and we have a sense of, you know, we have a sense that we might lose our own territory, you know. So, you know, you know, this is not the area we, we can make some difference or not, but, you know, we have to concentrate, concentrate uh, some uh, resources on that, you know, for the time being, you know. Nobu? Yes, um, I think there are many things, but one thing I could say, especially because I'm a Southeast Asian specialist, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, it's there. There in in overall, you have United States and China, and you are always um, kind of politically pressured to pick, or for example, or uh, uh, you know you have to you kind of bet on certain things. Um, I think j there is a role for Japan that you, that makes sure you don't have to pick, or the, there's a uh, it's it's a very good stabilizer. Um, Especially because of 
the, the history of Japan, which we really count on in the 60, 70 years. Um, you know, the economic power of Japan didn't translate into a military power. So I think that, that trust of you know, positive economic power uh, cr creates a space for many countries in Asia that there is always the second choice. It, could, it, does, it might not be the best choice, but there's always a second choice. You don't have to rush for uh, answers like maybe for the North Korean case as well. So I think that that political space, that political choice that Japan can offer in every country in Asia, and which is pretty big in, in many ways, not just in economic terms, but in political terms as well. I think that's where um, Japan can make a difference, and that could be a, a, a big stabilizer um, when many countries are like not in the, like the Cold War period. You know, the Cold War period, in, especially in Southeast Asia, was the, the front line of the war. You don't want that kind of uh, friction. So, um, where's how do you do that? There's always a second choice, third choice. Um, I think that's very important, and that's where Japan can make a big difference in, in, in every part. Yeah. Amy, pretend you're the advisor of the Japanese government. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I would say to, uh, to Prime Minister Abe that I think finding a way to coordinate with China on managing a changing international economic order, not just preserving what we've had, but managing a changing economic order, uh, would be enormously significant um, and would be very much in Japan's interests. I think there's enough overlapping of interests between Japan, China, Southeast Asian countries, Australia and others, that there should be a way to find a path through that. Um, and it would be enormously significant not just for that bilateral relationship, uh, but also because I think what it would symbolise to other countries like Australia, India and others who are nervous about what the rise of China means, that it's possible for the most adversarial of relationships in some ways to actually eke out some kind of you know, negotiated um, new order. Thank you, Amy, and thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you very much.